Uh, good morning from California, everyone. Um, as Wolf mentioned, I'm going to be presenting automated packaging for multiple platforms, talking about the experience from <clears throat> packaging for Ross. Uh, Steven has helped greatly with setting this setup. Uh, he'll be joining us for the Q&A, but in light of the short talk, I'm just going to give the whole talk. So I'm going to talk about why, how, and how we choose to be different and why we chose to be different. Give me a little bit of background about who I am. Uh, these are some of the projects I worked on. I started off with autonomous driving in the desert uh, with Caltech. We did some more autonomous driving in the desert. That's actually me getting into the van in the middle. And then that's also me next to the Prius that we took did for the Urban Challenge. After that, I was spent some time at Willow Garage, started working on Ross there, and I've continued working on Ross at Open Robotics for uh, eight plus years now. Hard to believe. So, make all these things happen. I want to talk a little bit about Ross and what is the the tool, and then get in, motivating a little bit about why we were we've gotten to where we are. Uh, Ross is the biggest robotics framework out there. It's open source with a liberal license. Um, the most valuable part of the community, it, most valuable part of Ross that I see is the community. Because we're here as a large community distributed around the world and we all collaborate together to generate this thing that everyone can use and build on top of. Um, because we keep this community growing and ever make it easy for people to contribute, um, that's how we've gained scale and been able to get into more use cases that people can uh, leverage Ross inside. Uh, one of the challenges Ross is generally stands for robot operating system. It's not an operating system. Uh, it's more of a framework. It has core plumbing, middleware, etc. It has tools for debugging, building, etc. There are higher level capabilities which are things like, oh, I want to navigate. Here's a navigation stack that does navigation for you in an indoor space or a variant for outdoors or arm planning. There's lots of different capabilities that you can put together. And of course, the ecosystem, which is that all the packages and functionality that the entire community contributes together. And also the ability that like, hey, this student used Ross in grad school in their lab. They're familiar with it and they can hit the ground running when they start at the new job or when you tr if someone transitions jobs. If there's a general lingua franca of like, hey, here's how to do, build a robot, here's how to communicate with one, tools are reusable, et cetera, within the community. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of different application spaces that Ross is being used in. We have agriculture, uh, robots out there doing farming, healthcare. Uh, there's a lot of demand for robots to move things around. There's labor shortages in many of these different industries, and robots are helping fill those gaps and make people more efficient, be able to do more things. Uh, there's a ton of things here. I have a whole slide deck on that, but in light of the topic of this discussion, we're going to keep rolling. So to that end, I want to talk about why we've been approaching things a little bit more differently from the Ross, Ross point of view. Um, to give a little bit of context, Ross was started back in 2007, 2008, depending on where you count the first, the beginning. But back then, as an open source project, we were on SourceForge because that was the cool place to be. And they were great. They provided us free hosting. And although we have this great picture of somebody really enjoying being a grad, graduating, um, one of the things is that most students are heads down, focused on their work, and they only have time to do a little bit of package maintenance. They need to do the things that are gonna get them to that graduation because that is their primary motivation. And as we started Ross, we wanted to be able to um, enable those grad students and the undergraduates and the students to be able to build and collaborate quickly. Um, so with that, we need to be able to think about what, how can we do fast iterations? How can we have a small group of maintainers that everybody can do and automate everything possible? So 
what are some of the other things that we needed to be able to do uh, to support these users? We needed to be able to do side-by-side -side installations, uh, system and or user space. Different grad students, different people working on this will need different, um, different versions of things. So we need to be able to support side-by-side. Uh, a lot of people weren't wait, willing to wait for packages, so we need to be able to support full force builds moderate quickly. Um, and with that, to support the side-by-side -side installs and source checkouts, we need to be able to do a distribution-wide checkout and build pipeline. But because we're using maintainers who are non-experts and they're focused in experts in their field, but not in packaging and release management, um, we wanted to be able to support them being contributing quickly and easily. And also, ROS is a large sprawling ecosystem, so we don't necessarily need to want to be able to have to install like every build, install and build everything. You only need to get the parts that you need. And we also wanted to be multi-platform, we multi-language to allow people to iterate quickly in Python, but then also be able to optimize things in C and C++. We want to be quick, and it needed to be easy to get people going in like five minutes. So. <clears throat> We made some good choices. We made some bad choices. To start off, uh, we were supporting in-source builds, aka the objects all dropped right next to the source, at least in a separate directory, but like right there in the tree. Um, to build, we didn't have an install target, so we were doing things like padding the directory names of our checkouts and just building in spot in place, and then we would do things like fix the R path by just running said over executables, uh, tar up the results, and add some Debian metadata. Bingo, we've got Debian packages. <clears throat> and it turns out, as many bad practices are in there, it generally worked. And people were very happy to have it there. So with that said, um, think about what your users want and <clears throat> what the needs are, and that can help drive, drive where you go. Um, we did do a couple of good things. We picked out Oct Ross um, as an FHS layout. We are registered as a provider for Ross, which actually makes using Oct Ross be compliant. And the other thing we did early on was we created a package.xml format um, that helped us to find the information in the package such that we could snarf it and use it in automated fashions. Technically, the original version was manifest.xml, but we evolved it to package.xml. So <clears throat> there are a lot of things that we did along the way. Another important one was ROSTEP. Uh, for those of you not familiar with ROSTEP, it's a central database of dependency resolutions with the ability keys for each platform. So if I want to install GCC in my package.xml, I can simply declare GCC. And then the database has a lookup. On Fedora, it's in this package. On Debian, it's in this package. On Ubuntu, it's in this package. And we have support for versioning etc. So if GCC moves from one package to another, we can update that. And it's really great through the community. Uh, through the community, we've supported this long list of package, uh, lost list, long list of platforms. And we have the ability for people to extend it and keep custom forks, etc. of the database. And we also have knowledge of the apt, yum, pacman, pkg, npm, pip, source and apk. Um, that was a quick audit. I think there may be more. But uh, it's been really great to see it grow significantly beyond what the core project has done from the community members. So <clears throat> we're also starting this process back in the late aughts and, <clears throat> sorry. Tools of the trade at that time, just getting com getting started was Git build package pipeline. The rep repository was there and Jenkins. These were the state of the art tools then. And so we picked them up and ran with them. Um, as I mentioned, we already had the package.xml. And now that we had the ROSTEP database, we can automatically generate the Debian metadata. Um, from there, the Debian metadata is put into the Git build package repository. And then we can create DSC files and upload them to an app repository. And then we automatically create Jenkins jobs to generate the DSV files into DEBs and upload those back to the repository. 
One of the important things for this is that we use an automation release automation tool called Bloom. Um, this is super valuable because there's a whole lot of small intricate things that you need to do when you're creating Debian, <clears throat> Debian packages in particular, which is where we started. Um, it pulls the data from the package.xml and the ROS distro and creates everything you need in the Debian control files. It also has the ability to do things like check out and isolate end packages from an upstream repository so that you can have a repository with say 10 packages <clears throat> and you just have to run Bloom on that once and it'll actually generate 10 different Debian packages as a result. And lastly, it will also based on your source distribution create a pull request to our main ROS distro index so that you don't have to do any of the fiddly bits on top of that. Important things we've learned in this is that templates, um, sorry, We've gotten feedback on this process from say the Debian community and their first response is templates are not as flexible. You can't do everything. Uh, but we've learned that this actually does a strong majority of cases and we have the ability to override and patch any of the stages of the release pipeline. Um, this allows us to incur the upfront cost with a couple of experts. The standardized standardization is actually easier for users. If you just tell them like, this is the formula you follow. This is how you can do it. We actually have a large number of new community members doing one-off releases, and they can do it because we've standardized more. And the other cool thing that I'll get into a little bit later is that we have the ability to <clears throat> extend this. When you have a new expert come in with a new system, we can say add support for a new package manager. So this is a little bit complicated. I don't have a lot of time to go into full depth, <clears throat> but this is the general pipeline. There are two places where a human has to input. They're gonna tag the upstream repository and then they're gonna run Bloom release and get the whole process going from there. The Bloom release will generate release artifacts in the release repositories, create a pull request for the uh, ROS distro. Once that's merged, the ROS distro cache will update. Our Jenkins jobs will reconfigure and trigger all the cascading jobs from there. If you follow the red trigger lines, they will go over and gen trigger Debian uh, Jenkins jobs for the source packages. And each one of those will trigger the downstream binary packages. Those all get pushed back to the building repository. And those automatically sync to the testing repository once things are built. And then we have a <clears throat> QA process to take things to our main repository. But I'm blushing over a couple of things here. I'm only assuming three arches. We can support N arches, depending on what configuration you want to target. Um, I've also made the assumption that there's only one package per repository. As I mentioned before, there can be up to N of them, depending on your um, code, uh, source code development practices. So if you take the top right corner, um, there's the source and three binaries. Multiply that by N for each of the packages in the repository. And of course, if you um, really think about it, each binary, we don't assume ABI compatibility by default. So every binary triggers all the downstream binaries to be rebuilt. I've only shown this for one tree, for example. So it's uh, this gets complicated and big. And like if you release a core dependency, it triggers a large cascade of products building. But as I mentioned, we have the ability to extend it to a new package manager, say yum with RPMs. Um, to, what we need to do to do that is generate metadata for the spec file. Luckily, we have the package.xml and the ROS distro, which has all the information we need. We just need a good template and some logic to put it in. Uh, we have to add a pulp3 repository because uh, Fedora and RPMs don't store in Debian packaging repositories. And we need new build job templates to leverage mock to actually build these tools. Um, <clears throat> but to the user, the experience is the same. The software developer, the dependency management tools are the same. The package XML is the same. And they just run Bloom to make a release. And it generates the spec files and all the metadata necessary for RPMs in addition to the deb files and the DSCs. 
So here's that diagram. It keeps getting smaller. Um, I've added Fedora across the top where you can see there's one source package goes to and binary, so they cascade down to below, and the RPM repositories are maintained in parallel with the Debian ones. Uh, there's a lot of little red, blue data transfer lines that I've skipped in this because it just gets too messy. So I've talked about DEBs, I've talked about RPMs, um, but there's a large ecosystem of packet managers out there that come in lots of different flavors, and some of them focus on source-based distributions. Um, with uh, my former intern, Hunter Allen, uh, we actually extended this to work for Gentoo. We have the same inputs. There's the ROS distro and its cache and the release repositories. And with Superflore, uh, an extension and of Bloom, we've taken that ROS distro and now we can generate ROS overlays for Gentoo. So if you want to go to on a Gentoo system, you can point to the ROS overlay which just takes the metadata that we already had and restructures it into the format that Gentoo wants and pumps it out so that you can just point your Gentoo installer at this overlay and it'll work um, as all the usual Gentoo world works. Uh, you can run this on a cron job or manually. And the best thing is there's no upstream maintainer changes that are needed. Um, Hunter basically single-handedly did this occasionally submitting pull requests for issues that where it didn't build or something like that because Gentoo had different versions, et cetera. Uh, but we generally were able to make those cross-platform pull requests such that it just improved the quality of the core implementation and we didn't significantly create intermediate layers that were specific to Gentoo. The really cool thing about this is that this was also picked up by LG and extended to work on Open Embedded such that it could um, you can do the same thing, so there's a meta ROS layer that's fully generated from the ROS distro. <clears throat> so we can do this on gen almost anything. Um, the common practice is to do this on snapshots. When we do a sync to public on the for the Debian packages, the open embedded team will pick up that snapshot of the ROS distro and just generate the meta for that one and tag it similarly. Generates the source. Uh, I'm going to keep going in light of time. Uh, so mostly, I covered this previously, but I'll share out the slides too. So we have some places where we've diverged from what Debian upstream policies are. We have side-by-side -side installation default. Um, we require activating the workspace to be enabled to side-by-side installation. Uh, one of the things we have not done is separate out of the dev packages from the libraries. And we don't use the very specific naming language prefixes like Python dash and lib dash that are in the Debian infrastructure. Um, this is partially because we just need to be able to support our users with different requirements. From this, we've learned a lot of things. Um, Stephen gratefully, helpfully put together this great chart which shows the number, a histogram of the number of packages per maintainer and the number of maintainers. So there are just over 200 maintainers who have released one package in the ROS distros. There are over 500 maintainers who have released uh, two to 10 packages. There's over 200 who have released 10, 11 to 50, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually have a couple of people who have released over 300. Um, to make all this happen with a more classic approach, we would need something like 10x the number of maintainers. Okay, uh, keep it moving here. The important things we did, so we have package.xml with standardized metadata in the source. This means that it's there and it can be used in any system, whether browsing, et cetera. We created the ROS distro, which lets us keep track of everything and have a grouping that the, we can generate subsets, et cetera, from. And the cross-platform cross dependency management ROS step has been key to this. Um, in response to the keynote, I had some fun things and realized that we also have a source pipeline. We have a ROS install generator, which takes the ROS distro, generates Git URLs. We have a tool, ROS install or VCS tool that can take those and clone them all into your workspace. Then you can use ROS app and the package.xmls to generate your dependency list, install them, and then you can just build from source. So depending on your definition, what is a package manager, this may cover it. 
I'm super happy to say there's uh, active work going on in ConduForge, getting RoboStack. Uh, this RoboStack team is working on this to make ROS available in Conda and ConduForge. We're always looking to automate more. We're looking to unify Bloom and Superflore, and we have a kind of a idle or archive project to make ROS step more generic called Xylem, so that we could try to push it out to a larger community and not have ROS in the name. So with that, here's several references and ready for questions. Um, Steven's also here to join and help answer questions as well. Awesome. Thanks for the talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and share what we've done. I see some questions coming in now, maybe, on Element.io. So there is a question from Fan. Um, how have how have packages in Rust grown over the years? Uh, there's several different metrics of how they've grown. Um, the number of packages has significantly grown. We've went up from the first Rust distributions. We had a couple hundred packages. Now we have. Um, several thousand packages per distro. I think on the order of 2,000 is where we're at. Some of them went up, I think, approached 3,000. Uh, but the cool thing is in that same time, ROS packages have gotten smaller. Um, as I mentioned, the early tarballs, some packages were hundreds of megabytes. And now we're down more often than measuring things in kilobytes. Uh, we've also worked to split out debug symbols to pull them out separately and optimized with the install targets so that we only install the necessary elements. Cool. There's another question from Ryan. I'm not clear on what it what this looks like in production. Do you install everything under OpRos? Uh, yes, everything gets installed into OpRos. Um, that way we have we, we use OpRos and then the name of the distro. So we have our current active distros, our Foxy, Galactic, and noetic as well as our rolling distribution so everything uses the prefix opt ross distro so opt ross melodic opt ross noetic opt ross foxy opt ross rolling Someone is typing on Element.io. I think we have time for one more question, but it would be great if, yeah, there comes the question. So it's a follow-up question from Fan. Uh, what has driven ROS packages to be smaller? Did that raise additional considerations in dependency management, et cetera? Uh, yeah, so the, the dependency management, um, definitely helps make things smaller. A lot of times we were doing sort of, you know, we need GCC install build essential. Um, and it turns out that a lot of times you can be more granular with the packages. Um, that, incre that decreases the overall installation size because if we're more granular, we can specifically call out like, I need the GCC executable or I need all of the compiled libraries for a different cross target platform. Um, at some point, we had large granularity on the keys, and we've been slowly focusing, bringing them down. And the other one was on that front was to uh, not leverage the, uh, or sorry, the the other one on that front was to not overly declare, like don't say you need GCC when you only need a subcomponent of it or um, a Python generator or something like you can uh, maintainers we're over declaring things um, and then just getting better and more efficient about like installation targets, et cetera, helped. <laughs> 